Welcome back to Nick Lane's Comic Corner, Classic, Size, Non Classic. This is episode number 702 and double show number 606. One DC trade, one Marvel trade. Alright, first up it is from DC Comics Aquaman Volume 6 Maelstrom, collecting Aquaman Volume 7 issues 32 to 40 and his stories from Secret Origins number 2 and 5. Yep, everything in here is pretty much written by Jeff Parker. Yep, Jeff Parker writes everything, and here are the artists on here. Yep, Carlos Rodriguez, Alvaro Mar Martinez, and Daniel uh, HDR. Mm -hmm. The cover is on by Paul Poliert, uh and Sean Pearson, who was the inker of this book. Mm -hmm. Now, there's pretty much about two, kind of like three major stories in here. First, it starts off with the Secret Orders issue, just kind of basically telling what Aquaman was up to prior to... It's basically his New 52 backstory, which... Well, I could tell he mostly kept canon of his pre-flash, pre-flash myself of him being the, the son of Tom Curry, um, not Tim Curry, Tom Curry. People think Tim Curry, people think of the actor. This is Tom Curry, the fisherman. Yep. Mostly they kept pretty much mo mostly everything canon. From what I could tell, the only change they make is the fact that uh, Doctor Sheen, who had been a recurring character in Aquaman, yeah, it shows him in the flashback as well. That's pretty much the only change I can make uh, that I can tell. Plus, of course, him living in Amnesty Bay, which is something he did not do in pre-Flashpoint. He lived very soon places, but never lived in Amnesty Bay, which was I thought was a real neat thing Jeff Johns did. Uh, this is by far Jeff Parker collect Jeff Parker's second and last trade of the collector's run. His run was not very long, not as long as John's run, which was 25 issues. This was 15 issues. I'm not kidding about that. It's 15 issues and one annual he put out during his run. Yep. Uh, yeah. Pretty much the main story in here. Which it, now I will get to that in a minute. Yeah, it starts off with the Secret Origins issues, which, like I said, just be pretty much details uh, Aquaman's back history, and of course, uh, even a story about Mirror, which was really nice. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now the other ones is just well. Couple standalone stories, like one focusing on like mo mostly issues 32 and 33 are set up for the storyline Maelstrom, where we find out that Aquaman's mother, who apparently had been dead prior to this, is in fact alive. Yep, she apparently uh, was. Uh, it was the story was going around that she died via assassination, and Aquaman kept visiting her too, which was a nice thing to do. I mean, after all, this is his mother. Pay basically pay respects. And then he opens up the tomb and like, nope, she's not there. The whole thing was a farce. He does eventually find his mother, and his mother basically is not believing she actually really, he really is her son. Because she was told that both Tom Kurt, both Tom and Arthur were both killed by some people. But, yeah. Turns out it was all a complete lie to her. Uh, she was lied to. And this is by far a really dang good story. Oh, those even curious about the cover. Um, the original cover said there was a quotation mark, uh, a, like question mark there. King no more. Yeah, this is actually from cover. This is from issue 34. The start of this really interesting story. Also, when this thing came out, they had like a border banner on the side of what the story was. Yeah, I like the fact DC was doing this. Uh, it was a really interesting idea. They had the border on the side. And what part you're on? Yes, there are some books at DC Comics that did in fact do this. Not every single one did this particular point, but yeah, that's what happened. And this is by far a really awesome story. And it's weird though, Jeff Parker left after this. Yeah, he left after this really awesome story. And of course, at the end, Aquaman gets his late mother's uh, spe specter, uh, scepter. And of course, he flicks at this king. Though you can kind of say this book is kind of loosely setting up what Dan Abner would do. Though Colin Bunn would kind of ignore it. Aquaman on the run from Mirror for some reason. Yeah, but... Yeah, Cullen Bunn took over after this, did a weird eight-issue run, and they have Dan Abba kind of continuing with Jeff Parker started. Yep, I give this book 9.5 out of 10. I don't really know why Parker left the book. I mean, Jeff Parker is a fantastic writer. I'd say the only book I was disappointed with with him writing it was Just Like United. That book I was disappointed with. This book I was not. Because this is probably by far one of his best books he's ever done. He also he's also done uh, Thunderbolts. He also he also did the book when the book was called uh, Dark Avengers. Yeah, he stayed up for that. I mean, if you look at this guy's work, this guy is one fantastic writer. He, I mean, Jeff Johnson was awesome. 
this run was fun. Really fun. And then he was moved re- in place with Colin Bunn, who is a good writer, by the way. But I thought, but in my opinion, when it comes to Colin Bunn's run for uh, Aquaman, check out my review of Volume 7. You'll find it on my channel. All right. Next up, it is an X-Men book, X-Men Bizarre Love Triangle, collecting X-Men Volume 2 issues, 70, 171 and 174, written by Peter Mullock and artwork by Severoca. Yeah, those of you who have seen my Star Wars reviews, uh, I, I keep bashing several Arc Wars, uh, like, a tro- like really bad artwork. Here, it's not that bad. It's kind of like when he does Star Wars, he gets really damn lazy. Here, it's actually not bad, actually. It's actually really good artwork. And believe it or not, this came out like rough like a little over a decade ago. Yeah, this came out back in 2005. Yeah, this came out 13 years ago. And this is much better artwork than he does there. What's the story for this one? Okay, Bizarre Love Triangle. It's all about Gambit and Rogue. Yeah, that's the whole... It, the X-Men are going on some mission to find some alien or whatever. Though it does, follow, they do mention what happened in the previous story. This one, it's basically uh, about a woman named Fox who joins Gambit's class and seduces. Also, Bling. This is an early appearance by Bling in here. I think this is her first appearance. Let me look her up on here. But I think this is an early appearance by her. Let's see. Yeah, this is actually her first appearance. Yep, those of you who uh, remember my review for the the X-Men Legacy part of Nation X, this storyline is her first appearance. She doesn't do very much in here, but yeah, this is the story that makes her debut. What is the whole bizarre love triangle thing? Well, Fox turns out is actually really Mystique. Yep, Mystique. Who came to the X-Men to seduce Gambit away from her, her adopted daughter, Rogue. Yeah. That's what the story is. A woman who is older than Gambit. Like, uh, this has been many suggestions of how old this woman is. Uh, there was a suggestion that she was 150. Uh, another comic says she was in her 80s, though she looks freaking good for her age. Though there was a flashback of her took place in the 1800s. It's very confusing how old she is, but I know she, in fact she's older than freaking Gambit. I mean, she's older than people. Gambit's like grandmother or great-grandmother. Yep, though eventually Rogue and Gambit do get married in X Men number 30, which I eventually we'll talk about that when the trade comes out. Yeah, but this this is not that bad. It's a weird thing Peter Mullen is gonna do. I mean, he, after he did like a really weird start, this is more weird. Yep, though after this he does that uh, really awesome crossover with Black Panther. Yep, I'm gonna give this book a. 9.5 out of 10. It's actually, I gotta say, by far, this is actually an improvement over the, the opening story in Golgotha. Though, it does have one small problem. It's only four issues. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, why in the world are you doing, um, like, here's kind of the weird thing about this era, is that Peter Mulligan only did four issues story. He never did any big epic ones like a lot of other writers do. Heck, Mike Carey can do a lot more issues than this guy did when it comes to Stark. This one was just a quick little thing. Uh, as far as I can tell after this, next was, um, there was a few more stories he did after this one. The next one was Wild Kingdom, and I think after that was Day After, and then Blood Apocalypse, and, like, there's like three more storylines that come right after this. I have Blood Apocalypse here. I'm reading right now, but, yeah, there's only three major story arcs that he did after the storyline wrapped up. Wild Kingdom, which was the quest of Black Panther, Day After, and Blood Apocalypse. That is really it. Yeah, this guy's run was only collected in about five trades. Which, yeah, that's freaking sh- that's not that much. Yeah, and the reasoning for that is, the guy is wrong only lasted for a little over a year. Yeah, if you look it up, his run lasted from 2005 to 2006, and he left at the Blood Apocalypse. Yeah, I will talk about that particular storyline uh, possibly next episode, because I'm reading it right now. Yep. Otherwise, though, that's really it for this episode. Uh, not much else to say, but I gotta say, I gotta hand to him for making a good Gambit of Rogue story. Oh, and by the way, uh, the other people were supposed to follow the Ross at this point, 
they don't do anything at all. I mean, Emma Frost contributes very little to the story. Havoc contributes nothing to the story at all. For someone who's supposed to be the leader of this particular uh, uh, group, yeah, he took over as leader of, of this, the Team X-Men who occupied this title with when uh, Chuck Oz left, took over the book with issue, I think it was like 157. Yeah, for the third arc right after, um, for the third major story arc that happened right after uh, Grant Morrison left, like, this one was a lot better than the second one. They do reference it, but if you, if you read the, if you finish reading this arc, there is no actual villain at all. It's Mystique basically seducing a younger guy to get away from her freaking daughter. Though, adopted daughter, though, is never officially official. Yeah, though, she did raise Rogue, but she didn't legally adopt her. Yeah, it's a bit confusing when it comes to her. And she does have... Uh, one thing I do appreciate about this book, she does have interaction with her son, a, a guy who she couldn't give a damn about anyways. Yeah, she has never cared about Nightcrawler at all. Yeah. And yeah, she cares about Rogue, but she doesn't care about her own flesh and blood. Someone who she gave birth to. Probably because the reason why I couldn't give a damn about him because his father's a freaking demon. Yeah, thank you, Chuck Austin, for making his father a freaking demon. Azazel. I will eventually talk about his storyline when I get a chance to get my hands on that bizarre first appearance of Azazel from the Draco storyline. No, it's not the same. It's it, the, the, the name is, as far as it is, not come from Draco, not far from Harry Potter. It's just named the story arc. But yeah, Azazel is a Chuck Austin creation. Yeah. But otherwise, though, that's it for this particular episode. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode, episode number 703, double shot number 607. But the next bit I'm going to do later is going to be my One Piece review. Yeah, I'll do that. The reason I do this now is because I had a headache earlier. Um, like, after my previous video, the reason why I took, like, like a couple hours to finally get a chance to do this, because I've had a headache the past few hours, so I didn't want to basically be delirious when I'm doing these reviews. But, these aren't good. Yep. So, I'm a little better now, so, you probably get a chance to see the review, probably, like, about an hour, at most, when it comes to One Piece. Alright? Well, I'll tell you, see you in the next review. Bye.